That's right. What's us? The shift show. What a shift show. Hello, Laura. Hi. Yay. We're back. <laughs> Boy, I have a question for the cards today. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hit me. All right. My question is because I have been, you know, you talk about uh, Michael Singer, you talk about Eckhart Tolle, and I've gotten into Eckhart Tolle recent. I hope I'm saying his name right. Um, and been listening and very powerful. But I want to know, like, there, here's a guy who was like overnight. It's spiritually enlightened. I want to get cards. If you could pull a card, is there a shortcut? Can we just cut through the chase and get to it? A shortcut to what? Enlightenment. <laughs> I, thought, yeah. I thought you went to Boston. No, okay, to enlightenment. <laughs> Amazing. God, you're not the first person to have asked that, I bet. I'm exhausted like, from this. This Eckhart Tolle guy, how did he get it overnight? Yeah, why him? Why can't we have this? Mm -hmm. It's very irritating. I want to know. Yeah, I mean, all right. Well, I mean, I got I, I don't know what to say to that, so let's ask the cards. <laughs> <laughs> oh, guru. I want Is to cheat, there a shortcut for enlightenment? Judy would like to know. I want to cheat. <laughs> <laughs> Could I have? Do you have? Do you have that game in the the US mulligan? A mulligan. And ladders. Do you have that one? Shoots and ladders. Oh, shoots and yeah, it's called shoots and ladders here. Go, go, can can we have a shoot? No, no, a ladder, please. Can we have a ladder? <laughs> or or a, if you're playing trivia night, it's a mulligan. Can I have a mulligan? <laughs> <laughs> All right, the cards. I'm. The, the, all right, we're completely riding by the seat of our pants, folks, here. All right, so we have the Justice card. I'm using the traditional deck today. And we have the Two of Cups. All right, hang on, sorry, the sun. We're in the beautiful autumn sun here, and it's making it hard to see. Um, all right, what are we... I'm from the East Coast, and I'm in the Midwest. <laughs> Is it dreary with you? No, it's a beautiful day today, actually. Oh, okay. yeah, it's a gorgeous, day. gorgeous. I mean... Who doesn't love autumn? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm just going to start talking because I have no idea where this is going to go. So the justice card is a really important moment in the major arcana. Um, for those of you who don't know, the major arcana is this kind of journey of the soul. And it starts um, with the first seven cards where it's all about the ego and building the ego. And we've all been through that stage. It's not possible, I don't think, as a human to not go through that stage. And it's what you do as a kid in your, in your teens, in your 20s, you're building a life, right? You're putting together the marriage, the house, the job, the career, the whatever. And then you hit um, card number seven, which is the chariot, and things start to get uncomfortable. And many of us, not everybody, but many of us hit that phase right around our first Saturn return, which is somewhere around 29. And, um, but of course, at that time, we're also doing things like getting married and having babies. So as the picture builds, as we sort of, you know, we're very carefully selecting like, oh, you'll look good in my picture. I'll put you there. You look quite sexy. I'll, I'll get married to you. And then, oh, oh, having a baby. All right, great. And then things maybe start to go a bit wrong. And uh, some cracks start to appear and you start the to wonder. The puzzle pieces you know, aren't fitting right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like maybe on the honeymoon, you realize you actually don't love him that much. And um, and right after, so the chariot is kind of a moment where things start, the wheels start to come off, essentially. And that charge towards victory is looking a little bit hollow. And you can ride right over that if you want to. You can just completely ignore it. And a lot of people do. They just buy themselves a Ferrari and keep going. But the next card, if you choose to accept it, if you if you choose to accept this mission, is justice. And justice shows up and says, look, it might be time to reconsider. How about you think about, you know, taking responsibility of your life and not just doing what everybody told you you were meant to do? How, how about that? Well, you, you want, maybe you want to just kind of look at what's working for you and what's not. And, you know, the, the justice scales can often be interpreted. I'm trying to get out of the sun and I just can't get it. Sorry, folks. You're just not going to be able to see it. But anyway, they're holding the scales of justice in this card. And, you know, traditional interpretations saw that as you, you're being judged. you being, you know, are you right? Are you wrong? It's kind of a moralistic thing. When actually I think the new generation of tarot readers would see it more just in terms of what's working and what's not. You know, do you, do you like your life? 
are you are you are you chugging along thinking this is great do you wake up every morning like my two-year-old and go i'm back or do you you know go oh why is it monday again so so this and i'm starting to see maybe where this is going now so you know that moment where that many of us do choose to to take which is that moment where we just kind of pause for a moment and ask ourselves what's working and what's not is the is the entrance point for many of us right it's that point where we go mm, i don't know if this is working and Eckhart Tolle talks very clearly about that for him he has a moment just before his um enlightenment where he watches someone who's kind of insane basically and she's talking to herself on the subway and then he realizes that she's saying it out loud but he's got the same thing going on in his head i loved that part of the book because we all do i mean we have many voices in our heads not just mm -hmm. one and it's just completely right. human mm -hmm. and you know if it gets really extreme we call it schizophrenia and other things but the truth is we all have it and that's his first moment and all of us, when we have that moment, and it is kind of a justice moment, it's a moment where we get to essentially, we we can keep going oblivious and kind of stick our head above for a second and then stick our head back in the sand and keep burrowing. Um, or we can not do that. And um, the I feel like the Two of Cups is here because the Two of Cups is what helps a lot of us get there. Um, do you know the Course in Miracles? Have you, have you come across that? I Judy? have. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. So the Course in Miracles, um, actually I think Eckhart Tolle mentions it, but it's, it's just a series of kind of, um, lessons that you can read and, and meditate on and they help to essentially break down your thinking in a similar way to what Eckhart Tolle talks about. And he, he, you know, he, he obviously has respect for it. He mentions it occasionally, but a third of the lessons in The Course in Miracles are about how we are obsessed as a culture with the idea of the person who is going to complete us. Mm. Our soulmate, our twin flame, our the one. The one. When is the one going to show up? And me and Judy talk about it all the freaking time. All the time. probably bored of it by, by now. <laughs> anyway, I feel like this card is here. This Two of Cups card is here because the in the Ace of Cups, we are still whole emotionally. But very early on, you know, you, you, as soon as you're into Disney movies, you are splitting yourself off and you're already looking for your other half. And at that point, you are no longer whole. Mm. And so the moment where we sort of hit bottom with that and we realize, OK, I'm dating the same person with a different haircut and it's not going well. And I keep thinking I'm going to get the one and then I just get another kick in the butt, you know, that. I don't know about you, Judy, but my bottom, which happened right on time in my Saturn return when I was 29, definitely involved a really toxic relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mine uh -huh. have been nothing but toxic, and I see it now. It's right. interesting because as you were saying that, what came in my head was because I had asked the question of a shortcut. And the shortcut to me from those cards, and, and this is just my own feeling, I'm not a tarot reader, but in my gut is stop looking for somebody else. Your shortcut is right there. You, the mirror. <laughs> it's not That's, the one that we want to hear, is it really? <laughs> no, we don't want to hear it, but well, I Give mean, me another card, please. <laughs> I'll take another But it's another true, one, really, isn't it? I mean, yeah, isn't that what, you, you know, you think of, and I am, I, and the judgment card, am I being, am I asking the question, being judgmental of enlightenment? That's the other thought that went through my head. Again, I'm probably just going by my gut and I don't know anything about tarot, but um, that's what came to me. Am you I know judging everything enlightenment? You need to know about tarot, Judy. I promise you, if you, <laughs> whatever is coming to you instinctively is the right answer. I mean, I, you know, I love what you just said because I think part of what Eckhart Tolle would direct us to if this question was asked is the fact that we're so obsessed, the human mind is so obsessed with the future that the idea of enlightenment, even if we get obsessed with pursuing that, we are still in the problem. We're not living the solution. You're so right. We're still in the future instead of the now.
we're still in the problem. And, um, you know, Krishnamurti talks about it beautifully too. He said, it doesn't matter if what you're thinking about is drinking or God, you're still thinking. And that's the problem. Stop yeah. thinking. Um, and I mean, I don't know about you, but I have spent a very long time in my journey really obsessing about how to, this exact question, like, can I get the shortcut, please? Can I, how mm -hmm. am I going to get there? What, what exact combination of meditations and mantras and yada, yada, yada is going to get me, get me there? And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, we're, we're just focused on this thing and we're missing now. And that's the whole point that the brain cannot wrap its head around. No, our mind is still in the, in control at that point, instead of us being in control of the mind. And, mm -hmm. Instead of us just being. Yeah. Let me let me see if I can ask the cards like, I don't know, maybe just kind of what's the alternative? What are we? Oh, I love it. Oh, you couldn't make this up. All right. Oh, my God. All right. So I pulled two. One of them is the Ace of Wands. Okay. The other is the Queen of Cups. And you literally, I mean, I the, they just, the cards just nailed it. So, um. Ace of Wands. So all the aces are the are the state that we come in as babies and uh, before the mind gets in the way and messes it all up or before the human ego, put it that way. And the, the wands are energy. And so the Ace of Wands is the pure energy flow that exists in our bodies, which is essentially joy. So the state that Eckhart Tolle describes that was really, really intense for him at the beginning of his enlightenment, and now I think is kind of, it goes in and out for him, but he's, I mean, he's always serene. He's not, he's never like worrying about whether he left the gas on. Um, the, this, this is what it's talking about. Ace of one state. It's just your energy flow is pure. And, um, and so, and then queen of cups is, the the practices we give ourselves each day to hold space for our own emotions so what are we looking at here in terms of solution stop worrying about when you're going to become enlightened stop asking for you know the 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 ladder and instead focus on what you know what your energy flow is doing right now and to me also the aces you know if you're not experiencing pure joy right now does join the club that's all mm -hmm. right um but the ace really points us to just awareness like aware I, I don't know about you but i don't think i even realized i had energy flow in my body until i did yoga for the first time age 30. yeah i didn't i had no idea or if i did it was through things i look back on now and see it I didn't see it as a child, as a kid, things that would happen. But I look back and go, that was what was happening, you know, mm -hmm. um, which is really crazy when I think about it now. Um, can Can you describe one of those incidents? Can you think of one? Absolutely. I mean, I had when ever since I could remember being young and probably three maybe is the, I can go back maybe, I would have, um, I think I've talked about this before, I would have this, um, tunnel of uh, like a tornado tunnel of black energy that I would see every time I closed my eyes. I didn't know what it was. I thought everybody felt it. And um, I look back now and see that that was sort of that energy thing. And at first I didn't know what it was. And then it wasn't until my dad or mom, I don't remember who said I was having a nightmare when I finally said something about it. And that's when it became a negative thing. Isn't that funny? Oh, interesting. So then yeah. the energy that was just kind of neutral became scary. Yes. And then that, I was so, definitely. that made me afraid of the dark. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. So I think that's what I remember. So, you know, if it's, it's hard to get that though, every day in a daily life. Um, and I think that the holding space, what you said about the queen, I think of holding mm -hmm. space. Queen of cups, holding space for our emotions. Yep. We're already there then if we could do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I was just reading um, the book, reminding me myself of, of, you read The Body Keeps the Score? No. What is it? Who is it by? Um, it's by some famous, it's a very famous book at this point. I, I, it's been around for decades, I think. And um, it's by Bessel van der Kohl, some we'll kind put, of we'll doctor. We'll have to put it in the show notes. And um, 
it's it's pretty famous at this point. And it was kind of uh, one of the first books to talk about how trauma lives in the body, which, of course, at this point is like, duh. Um, and um, in that book, they talk about how if you want to heal from PTSD, but also just from regular human trauma, you know, from day to day um, life, anything. Yeah. You have to be able to. Um, you have to be able to be with the sensations in your own body without freaking out, essentially. Mm. And what a lot of us have done over time because of things that happened to us as kids, even things that happened that seemed very innocuous at the time, um, we have dissociated to the point where we were not in our own body, essentially. Mm -hmm. And the process of landing back in your own body, I mean, I still literally remember age 30. I don't think, I love that you had that experience as a three-year-old. I don't think I remember, I don't remember when I was connected to my own energy as a kid. I, I don't know if it just got cut off early or what, but but I, I do remember the first moment in a yoga class where I felt my own energy flow for the first time. And I was like, ooh, what is this? And that sort of prompted an exploration of that that led to like lots of body scans and trying to encourage this and gradually a Qigong practice and Tai Chi and that kind of stuff. And then um, in 2015, when I hit like, just a, a deep, deep iceberg of anger within myself. What I realized was the only way I was going to heal that was by literally sitting with the physical sensations of it. Feeling that anger, living yes. with that, not being, and, and not And what Bessel, I've forgotten her name, but anyway, what this doctor talks about in The Body Keeps the Score is that in order to heal any kind of trauma, you have to get to a point where A, you notice what's going on in your body, which most of us don't. And then once you can notice it through mindfulness practices and what, what have you, whatever you choose to use, then being able gradually over time to really just not freak out when something's happening in your body. And, um, you know, I, I do a lot of this today and it really is this ace of wands, queen of cups work, which is, can you handle the fact that that person just triggered you and now you feel like there's a volcano in your body and you want to crawl out of your own skin? Mm -hmm. Are you going to scroll? Are you going to watch TV? Are you going to eat a cookie? Are you going to, you know, go and work a hundred hour week? Have or are you just going to sit, have a drink? Or are you right. just going to sit down and feel it? Mm -hmm. And that, and, and I love that these two cards came up as a solution. It's not a shortcut to enlighten, but my God, this is exactly what Eckhart totally talks about with the pain body stuff. He totally does. Totally does. And in that, I think that leads to what we should do, because I think um, you're really good at, at leading in meditation. And um, although you can you can be in the now and present doing anything. And I love that Eckhart Tolle talks about walking the stairs, being the present moment and feeling your steps, hearing the sound, being in your body. But you have a way of doing this. And this is, um, I think, a great time for a meditation if you're up for okay. it, Laura. Sounds good. Yeah, always. So if you're driving, don't do this, do it later. But if you can, uh, please get get comfy. Uh, if you're okay, comfortable music here. closing your eyes, do that. Yeah, we're going to give you some nice music to relax you a bit. And um, this is, um, I'm, I'm going to do actually something that Eckhart Tolle does a lot. And maybe we'll go from there and maybe something else will happen. So get cozy, close your eyes. And then just sort of hold your hands out in front of you. They don't need to be extended, but just hold them so they're not touching anything. And ask yourself, if I have my eyes closed and my hands aren't touching anything, how do I know that I have hands? And then bypass whatever your brain is saying, because your brain might be saying something like, what is she talking about? I don't know. I know I have hands because I've seen them in the past. And instead, just take your awareness into your hands and allow it to rest in the area and just see what happens.
And you might start to notice a tingling, a buzzing. You might want to use other words for it, but essentially what you're, what you're feeling into is your own energy flow. It's what we were just talking about. And in the East, they, they aren't afraid of this. They're not confused by it. They call it chi or prana or shakti. Here in the West, we're a bit, we're a bit more ignorant about this. But anyway, here, here we are feeling it. And if it's very faint, that's okay. I know that when I first started feeling this, it was extremely faint. But the reason why Eckhart Tolle starts with the hands is is because where most of us can feel it the easiest. And then you can check in and see if there's anywhere else in your body you can feel it. Can you feel it on the top of your head? Sometimes I can feel about a foot above my head, funnily enough. Don't know how that's possible. Can you feel... Your knee, can you feel your foot? You know, just sort of explore a bit. And often, you know, due to various traumas or experiences that are personal to you, you, there might be areas that feel completely numb. You might be wondering what I'm talking about in general. If so, that's all right. Just keep trying. I promise you it's there. And then, you know, in the spirit of what we were just talking about, I'm now going to direct you somewhere between your throat and your pelvis. This is where most of us in this area, in the torso and the pelvic area and in throat, this is where most of us carry the majority of our, what you might want to call trauma, what you could just, you know, in, in Sanskrit language, you would call it samskaras, but whatever you want to call it, it's the garbage that you're carrying around inside you, which is blocking you from you know, experiencing what Eckhart Tolle is experiencing. And so in this moment, just feel into if there's any area between your pelvis and your throat that's really talking to you right now. And by talking to you, I mean, is there a throbbing? Is there a pain? Is there a sort of tingling? I mean, it could be anything really. There's something that draws your attention. And You know, I don't want to put anyone in a state that they can't handle. So if this feels too much for you, then ease out, go back to your hands. But if it feels doable, then just explore a little bit what you just found, just noticing. Part of why we're doing this is because we want to show the brain, the rational brain, the bit of us that you know, also worries about things a lot. We want to show it that even though these sensations are uncomfortable, that they do shift and change over time, that they're not going to be there forever. Because one of the things the brain says is, oh my God, I'm going to feel like this forever. So just as you place your awareness where it is, just, you know, maybe you notice that it's already changing. It's intensified or it's gotten less intense. It's shifted location. And, you know, the the beauty of this work is that just putting your attention on it is what heals it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to intellectualize it. You don't have to pay lots of money to go and see a particular practitioner who does some funny thing and puts crystals on you. Not that any of that is wrong, but you don't need it. Your attention and your intention to become more of who you are is all that is needed. And you might also notice that as you put your attention on this spot that certain memories start to come, certain um, sounds, smells, sights, that again, you can try and understand it, but you know, don't, you don't need to. In fact, if we get drawn into the brain too much, then we're losing the point as Eckhart Tolle would, would remind us if we're, if we're in our thinking mind, we're still missing it. So come back to the body allow it to shift, to shape, to do what it is, place a loving hand on it if that feels good to you, and just know that 
you know, whatever is inside there, however stuck you feel, whether it's already morphed into some kind of illness, um, whether it's not, but it just feels really uncomfortable. There is nothing in there that is more powerful than the healing source, which is your attention. Because as you wield your attention, if you can bring what the Buddhists call witness consciousness to this, you are bringing the entire power of the universe to integrate this, whatever this thing is, whatever this misalignment is. We don't need to label it good or bad. It's just a sort of wiggle in the energy field that needs to be ironed out. It's a wrinkle that's making you less able to feel joy. So whatever you're feeling right now, I'm going to gently lead you out again. Let your body know that you can come back anytime, that you can pay more attention to this, that you can get lots of help with this. There are, there are all kinds of tools that can be brought to this, all kinds of tribes, all kinds of um, healing spaces. You don't have to do it alone. But just taking a couple of really good deep breaths, whenever you are ready, you can return to the room. Mm. Hey. So good. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> yeah, that you're welcome. That's what I'm talking about. That is what I'm talking about. I mean, <laughs> it's it's that um interesting when you brought up the absence of energy. Um where the absence was um for me was between actually the the root chakra and the throat but I felt pain in my jaw. And the minute I took where I felt the best energy in my hands, I just took them up to my jaw and all of a sudden it was relieved. Mm. Felt the energy just felt so good, which wouldn't, I talk for a living. So it doesn't surprise me, my jaw, you know? Mm -hmm. but yeah. That's, it's just, even if you go back to this meditation again and again and again, I mean, the beautiful thing is you can do that with this. There's going to be something you're going to find new every time. Right. Well, then, you, you know, there are so many, like I was saying in the meditation, there's so many tools out there. Um, you know, there's a free meditation app called Insight Timer that a lot of people use. And there are body scans on there that will take you into the body. Um, there's Calm, there's Breathe. Those are two that I know of that, yep. are, that have freebies too. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, Eckhart Tolle stuff online, um, the somatic processing. And, you know, if you can afford body work, then it is nice to have somebody just hold space for you in that way. But there's also other ways of, of holding space. You know, I know that at the beginning of my journey, I, I just, I went to a lot of women's circles where I felt safe enough that kind of the grief could come up in my body or the whatever, you know, and I'd have a good cry. And again, you don't really need to know exactly sometimes why you're crying. It's just, oh, here it is. And then it feels good. You've released something. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that. Um, it, I think it was Eckhart Tolle that talks about you don't have to be the guru on a mountain to be enlightened. You could do it anywhere. You could be in an elevator and and just get into that now moment and feel your energy start with the hands like laura just led us through um or or stop and how many sounds can you hear stop for mm -hmm. a second and just listen and you might start with what your body sounds like your breath or and then you know it's like mm -hmm. the interesting thing about that is i find that when i do that I'm able to better separate myself then from the outside, from the exterior when I really listen for it because we miss so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, of course, the classic question that gets asked is, well, you know, what if I'm not good at meditating? <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I am not good at meditating. If by good at meditating, you mean like getting to a place where I have no thoughts in my head and I'm like, um, everything is love right. and light. 
I think you're um, going to say, um. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I literally started seeing, started following the guru that I followed for a couple of years back in 2010 to 2012 because I read Eat, Pray, Love, and I wanted that meditation experience oh, that Liz God, Gilbert had. I was like, didn't you? I, I want that one. Yep. And I never got it. No. Nope. Um, but I'll, t I'll tell you this, it doesn't matter because the, the whole point of a meditation practice is to get good at coming back, at getting lost in something, whether it's like, you know, a thought or ruminating or something, whatever, and then to come back. And the whole point is that, so let's say, you know, somebody cuts you off in traffic you, your neurons have formed a certain behavioral pattern that you always go into whenever someone cuts you off, whether it's flicking them the birdie or going into like, oh my God, was it my fault? Like whatever your particular thing is that you always do. But as you develop a meditation practice, whatever that looks like, um, the, there is more and more spaciousness between you and your familiar response. And so you'll find yourself someday, somehow, watching yourself pull over instead of, you know, running after them to tell them what a bad driver they are and just pulling <laughs> over to the side of the road and, and taking a breath instead. And that, my friend, shows that you're good at meditation, not that you are on some, you know, amazing trip where everything feels one. So true. So true. So keep coming back. Keep trying it. I still suck at meditating, but I do it twice a day. You know what? That's a fantastic that you just keep trying. I mean, again, <laughs> just uh, just being the observer, as they say. And what does that mean? Well, just keep listening. We'll, we'll, I'm still learning. Um, keep them. I love how he said that with his book, Be the Observer Who's Obs Observing the Observer. <laughs> That's like, I've done that twice now. Um, and it is a really could just step back and then step back again. Crazy um, for, for a second. You know, that's the thing twice for mm -hmm. a second. But that split second of it's enough, it's enough. And it's enough. It to changes know everything. Yeah, it does that. You can go back there eventually. You know, that mm -hmm. that's, you know, mm -hmm. well, just that you I, know that it's possible changes everything. I feel like. Yes. And I the love, brain is like, I don't understand this. And then you experience it and you're like, oh, I don't really need to understand it. Exactly. Hey, mind, <laughs> guess what? I got this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, not that we don't keep trying. Well, of course. And I, but I love Good what you brains. said, mind question. And it does. It's really, if you're chasing enlightenment, that's chasing the future, which hasn't happened. And it's not the now. Yeah. Keep coming back, folks. We love you. We love you. And again, thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank Feeling you. the shift too? Let's connect and be the change. Subscribe free to What A Shift Show. And thank you. Enjoy the light, let it flow. In this journey we've begun. Ta -da. So I can end and record again. Did you know that? Oh. Watch. That's Better beautiful. Work. We won't even need to edit that shit. I know. I'm going to end and see what happens. End.